lot of people just want to sweep it under the rug. They want us to move on and be quiet and everything like that. I'm a loud mouth, so you ain't gonna fucking quiet me. The talk is cheap. Talk is cheap. You have to walk the walk, too. To walk the walk. Welcome everyone to another episode of Working People, a podcast about the lives, jobs, dreams, and struggles of the working class today. Brought to you in partnership with In These Times Magazine and The Real News Network, produced by Jules Taylor, and made possible by the support of listeners like you. Working People is a proud member of the Labor Radio Podcast Network. Follow the link in the show notes and go check out the other great shows in our network. And please support the work that we're doing here at Working People however you can. Leave us positive reviews of the show, share these episodes and get others to listen to them, and support us on Patreon if you can, which will also give you access to all the great bonus episodes that we publish there for subscribers. You can find the link to our Patreon in the show notes for this episode. My name is Maximilian Alvarez, and I'm going to cut right to the chase. We've got an incredibly powerful and important episode for y'all today, but it is also, I warn you, a very heavy episode that looks head-on at what happens when the darkest, most violent sides of humanity target the lives, the families, and the communities of our fellow workers. And I want to start things off with a heartfelt plea to everyone out there. I know this episode will be difficult to listen to, but I beg you to listen. It is truly the least that we can do. But I hope, as I have hoped from the very beginning of this show... As I have hoped with each and every one of the nearly 300 interviews with working people that we've published over the years, I hope that by listening, we will be stirred to do more. To stop accepting what is so demonstrably unacceptable in this broken society and this rigged economy. To fight harder for one another to stop helplessly watching the world burn and to start seeing ourselves and our fellow workers as the ones who are going to save it. That is my hope. What you are about to hear is a conversation that I had with Brett Cross. Brett is a small-town kid who grew up in western Texas, among the oil fields, near Odessa. He worked in the oil fields, worked his way up to doing pipeline work, eventually moving to green energy work. He was a foreman. He worked hard to provide for his family. And Brett was at work when he got the call from his wife, Nikki, that changed their lives forever. It was May 24th, 2022. Nikki was at their son's school, Rob Elementary in Uvalde, Texas. This is not a fucking joke, she said. There's a shooter at the boys' school. Yes, Brett and I talk about that day. And we talk about the unimaginable fight for justice and for real change that Brett and Nikki have been fighting ever since they learned that their son, Uzziah Sergio Garcia, age 10, was among the 19 students and two teachers who were murdered in the mass shooting. The other human beings whose lives were stolen that day are Nevea Alyssa Bravo, age 10, Jacqueline Jalen Cazares, age 9, McKenna Lee Elrod, age 10, Jose Manuel Flores Jr., age 10, Eliana Amia Garcia, age 9, Amory Joe Garza, age 10, Javier James Lopez, age 10, Jaise Carmelo Luevanos, age 10, Tess Marie Mata, age 10, Miranda Gail Mathis, age 11. Alicia Haven Ramirez, 
age 10. Annabel Guadalupe Rodriguez, age 10. Maite Juliana Rodriguez, age 10. Alexandria Ania Rubio, age 10. Leila Marie Salazar, age 11. Jaila Nicole Silguero, age 10. Eliana Cruz Torres, age 10. Rogelio Fernandez Torres, age 10. Irma Linda Garcia, age 48. Eva Mireles, age 44. Remember their names. Listen to Brett's story. Do not look away from the horrors that we have allowed to become commonplace, from the evil and violence that we have allowed every year to take more of our children from us. We have to confront this evil head on. We have to be brave for Uzziah, for Brett and Nikki, for our children, for our future, because it does not have to be this way. We can eradicate this poison from our society, but if we mean it when we say never again, then we have to fucking fight for it. And we have to keep fighting and keep fighting and keep fighting until we get there until we can look our kids in the face and tell them honestly that we did everything we could to protect them. Instead of just hugging them every day, wondering in the back of our minds if they will be next, because we didn't. My name is Brett Cross. My son, Uzziah, was murdered in the Rob Elementary shooting in New Valley, Texas on May 24th, 2022. Um, since then, I have been fighting my ass off to, to make changes for this world so that other people, other children don't have to suffer the same fate and other parents don't have to bury their children. Well, Brett, brother, it is so great to finally get a chance to talk to you. Of course, I wish more than anything that we were talking under better circumstances, and I can't even yes, begin to um, pretend to know how to express how sorry I am um, for your family, for your wife, Nikki, for, for your community. But please just know that all of us here at Working People are with y'all. We are sending all our love and solidarity, and we want to help however we can uh, to, to help you fulfill that mission because that concerns all of us. I mean, if there's one thing yes, I can sir. impress upon people listening to this episode right now, it's just that you can't sweep this evil under the rug. You have to confront it. We have to confront it. We cannot let this keep happening and no matter what happens now from now on we have to remember that one basic fact and that more than anything is what i hope folks get out of the conversation uh with me and brett today but again brother i'm i'm, I'm so grateful to you for making time for this and uh, i'm so you know grateful for the chance to sort of get to talk to you on the show about this because as we were discussing you know, I've been doing this show for years, talking to workers, union workers, non-union workers, people all around the country, but talking to them not just about their jobs, but about their lives, who they are, where they come from, what makes us us. I want to, like, start there, right? Because I, I, I also don't want to send the message that you and your life, your family's life, are only defined by the horrible, unspeakable thing that happened to you. And, and I hope that folks, the more that they learn about you and your family, the more they remember the human costs and stakes of everything that we're talking about here. This is not just a news story. These are our fellow workers who are enduring this, workers like Brett. And so I wanted to start there, brother, and just ask if, if we could kind of dig a little more into, into your story, your life, how you got to be the person that you are. Are you originally from that area in Texas? Well, first, I'd just like to to thank you for this opportunity, because anytime I do get talked to or anytime I do talk, it is about the shooting and the aftermath. 
Um, and one thing about everything is, you know, at this point, I don't, I don't want to be known as Red Cross. Like when people see me, they say Uzi's dad, and that means the world to me. But there is that side of me. There is the Brett Cross, the 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 human, the dad, and everything. So, you know, yeah, I um I started off working in the oil field. Um, I, I'm originally from West Texas, a little town called McCamey, that's about an hour south of Odessa, which is the only way to describe it because it's 1,200 people, or was when I lived there. Um, I started off in the oil field doing um, rouse about and pulling units and then moved up to pipelining, which I love to do. I pipelined for a few years and I absolutely loved it. Started off digging ditches and moved all the way up to uh, being a foreman of jobs. Um, and wait, wait, wait. Had... I got I to gotta call time out real quick. What did yeah. you love so much about digging ditches? <laughs> uh, I, I, it wasn't it wasn't the ditches. I didn't stay on the ditches for too long. I stayed on there for about maybe two months, and then I moved up to uh, to a, a helper uh, for the like the back hose and the track hose and everything like that. So yeah, th I mean those first few months suck digging ditches, but <laughs> you know you got to start somewhere, right? It isn't just you you don't just get to get in and be boss and everything. So yeah, I was I was a foreman by the time I was nineteen. Um, running jobs and whatnot. Um, and then I got injured on the job. Um, and they, the company tried to like screw me over and everything. So I just ended up quitting. Um, worked roused about a little bit more after that, once I could walk again, because I tore the ligaments and tendons in my ankle. Um, and then I went to roust about and then I stayed there for a year and then I got into wind. Um, so for the past decade, I was in, uh, uh, the wind, wind energy, the turbines and everything. So yeah, I, uh, worked at the site that I was at for around six years back in my hometown. And then, um, me and my boss got into it <laughs> and, uh, as one does, <laughs> yeah, ended up without a job though. Ended up catching a job here in Brackettville, which is like 30, 45, 45 miles west of Uvalde, give or take. And so when we were looking to move, you know, we were looking at Brackettville, which is a town smaller than the one we came from. Um, looked at Del Rio, which is a bigger town, about 30,000 people, but then ended up settling in Uvalde because it was only an hour from San Antonio. So it was easier to just, if we needed to do something or take the kids out or whatever, it was, it was easier to do so. And so, yeah, I did that for, I, I believe it was four years here. Um, got to the point where, you know, I didn't even have to climb as much as I, as I used to, because the other guys would climb up and they would call me if they had a problem, I'd tell them how to fix it. And then, you know, so I got to spend a lot of time in the office at, you know, towards the end of my run in wind. So Man. Yeah, that's that's the work history. That's wild. I mean, a foreman by the time you're 19, um, that's pretty intense because I'm trying to think of myself as a dumbass 19 year old. I wouldn't trust myself with a Phillips screwdriver at that point, <laughs> let alone, you know, an entire like a uh, foreman of an entire operation at a, at a drilling site. Like I, I wanted to just ask one question about that, because you, you even mentioned right that you were looking at places to move that were about the same size. I mean, I'm from Southern California, like the, the LA Orange County part. So I couldn't have grown up in a more different setting where it's just endless grid. I mean, you know, right? Like from the, from the mountains to the beach, endless grid, endless freeways. So when I hear that you grew up in a town of 1200 people, my mind immediately is like, what is that like? Like, what, I, I guess I just wanted to ask, like, if, if for folks, we don't have to dig deep into it, but for folks who have never grown up in a small town, uh, let alone a small western Texas town, like, what do you think folks from the outside don't know, like, or most should know about what life is like for, for y'all growing up in a situation like that? So the number one thing, and I find this funny as hell because it movies and and everything get it wrong we all don't wear cowboy hats first and <laughs> foremost um i mean you you see me i don't look like the the texans on tv um but no it was like my graduating class was 52 people um yeah so our like our graduation ceremonies are three hours long but it's ev you know everybody speaks everybody does the um 
the um shit what's that called the where they they give you money to go to college all of that right mm -hmm. um everybody does that but like the main thing i would think is um we had to drive an hour to a walmart wow. yeah yeah oh an hour to the movie theaters we had to drive at least 20 minutes for um fast food like when you live just in this little bubble like and it, it is so weird because I growing up in a small town like that, there's endless trouble to get into that isn't trouble in the small town. You know, like growing up, my mom would just tell us, you know, be home by the time the 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 street lights come on. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't have to worry about it. And we rode our bikes everywhere, you know. And so it, it was real. It was a simple life, like real simple. You not really any cares, really, unless you needed to go to Walmart, which then you had to you had to make day trips out of it. You know, you would be like, <laughs> it's like everyone getting the covered wagon. We're going to Walmart. <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. You know, you're like, all right, we got to go to Walmart. OK, well, then, you know, it's an hour there. So if you start at eight in the morning, it's an hour there. Um and then your hour or two in Walmart. And then by then it's like, okay, well, we're starting to get hungry. So then you do lunch and then you, okay, well, we have to go and buy this and this. So it would, they would be all day trips just to go to Walmart. Whereas like here now, like I, I was so excited that I could drive down the road and go to a Walmart. Like it was crazy. And then, and then COVID happened and then the Walmarts aren't 24 hours anymore. So that sucks. But mm. you know, you got to make your own fun as a kid. Right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. A lot of a lot of wandering around, a lot of doing stuff that you shouldn't going into place. So, like, there's a lot of land, too, everywhere around. And it's big oil filled uh, area in West Texas. So you would end up in properties that you probably shouldn't have ended up in just riding your bike and going, you know, to your friend's house. You might go through three different people's property and just try to run through as fast as you can. So it was, like I said, it was real simple um, and, and quiet for the most part. Well, and like, you know, it's, it's funny because I think like the closest I've gotten to that is like when I moved from California to the Midwest mm. and granted I was still closer to things like there was a mire down the street but when winter hits and it's like five feet of snow it might as well be on the moon and you're like well fuck do I like do I really want the cereal and milk that much or can I get by without it? <laughs> you know? like and if I'm going once I ain't going out again so tell me what you guys need now um so and, exactly. and, and yeah <laughs> and also I'm just, you know, a Southern California Mexican boy. Like I do not do well with the cold. So I also was bitching and moaning the whole time, but that's another story. <laughs> you and me both brother. That was the one thing I hated about wind turbines. So on turbines, um, in the winter, you're in an ice box and in the summer you're in the oven. So down here it gets, you know, we, we see, you know, a lot of days in the hundred plus degrees, like, you'll have weeks in 110 and then when you're inside a, a steel turbine it's just cooking you so it'd be like 135 140 in there and you're working jeez man that that makes the hairs on my neck stand up because that now i'm remembering being back in a warehouse in southern california that was like that it was like i'm in a i would go outside in the sun to cool off and i'm like yeah <laughs> like or if you're in the back of an 18 wheeler unloading that shit like you are cooking. You are literally cooking <laughs> in that, that Absolutely. Point. And then it's even worse. It's even worse in the cold too, because then it's just an ice box and it's just you're freezing and everything. And that's that's one thing about me. If my feet get cold, like I'm done. Fuck the job. <laughs> I, I don't care about my boss. I don't care about his feelings. I don't care about nothing. If my if my bones get cold in my feet, I'm done. I'm not doing nothing. So yeah, it's uh we had that big winter storm here a few years ago, uh, the one where Ted Cruz went off to Mexico and everything. Mm -hmm. And I mean it shut us down, dude. It it shut us down. We lost we didn't have electricity for five days. Um I I had a fire going outside the whole time. <laughs> like <laughs> That's no joke. I mean, like we were we were literally in Austin, me and my colleague Mark Steiner and, and Kayla Rivara, we were there in the end of September, reporting on this Death Star bill that 
I mean, for folks who are listening who don't know, I'll just give you the Spark Notes version. I mean, this is this is a big bill that we're reporting on at the Real News. But the whole point of it is that the governor, Abbott, and like the Republicans in the state house are stripping the ability of local governments to regulate shit and and to pass ordinances like outdoor workers in Texas should get mandated water breaks in places like Austin. And so now people who are working in the kind of conditions that Brett's describing in Texas, like su- supposedly legally, like no city or town or county has the right to mandate that these workers get water breaks to save their lives. Like that is the level of ridiculous that we're talking about here. And we haven't even gotten to the shooting yet. So, I mean, like, just yeah. buckle in because we're, we're going to get even more ridiculous as we go on. But that's just, I just couldn't I couldn't not point that out, like how absurd it is that everything you're describing amidst all that, they're trying to take water breaks away from workers at this point. Yeah. Well, and that's that's just Abbott in and of himself. He wants to destroy everything. But uh, luckily, you know, there is OSHA and you have to have water breaks. So the. Even if he wins or whatever on that bill, um, like these companies are going to make sure that they're workers or if not, they're going to have a lot of lawsuits on their hands because first of all, you're, you're only as good as your employee. You know what I'm saying? And if you don't treat your employee right, your employee ain't going to treat you right and then doesn't give a fuck about the job. You know, I've, I've been there myself. When when bosses started treating me poorly, I'm like, well, fine, then I'll just eat and skate and not go above and beyond. Um, so, yeah, it, it's it's really up to the to the bosses and to like the people carrying out OSHA mandates and everything. And to anyone listening to this, you got to speak up. You got to advocate like don't let them do this crap to you. Um, you know your body best. If you're outside working, you need water. Go get that damn water. No job is worth your life. So I just want to stress that before we move on. And not just that, but your job will hire somebody the day of your funeral. They don't care. The yeah. companies as a whole, they do not care. You're replaceable. Um, as unfortunate as that sounds, so take care of yourself because you only got one life. Um, these companies have millions of people wanting to work. So, you know, protect you. Damn. No, that's beautifully and powerfully put, brother. And and there there was one other thing that just jumped out to me. It connects it connects our childhood our childhoods that are otherwise very different. Because having grown up in in Southern California, in like the kind of area where the the oil rush was, in the hills, like, you know, in Orange County, like, there's still those old rickety-ass, like, oil rigs and, and towers dotting the the hills of my childhood. So, of course, my brothers and my friends and I, we would go climbing up those stupid things, and we really shouldn't have been. <laughs> but- no, it, exactly. We used to ride pump jacks. Like pop jacks are those things that you know they teeter and everything. They're, so you're they're riding it like you're riding it like a horse. We, <laughs> we we would ride those, and uh, looking back, I'm like, man, that was stupid. But at the time, yeah, there ain't nothing to do, so you might as well make the best out of it. So yeah, I can <laughs> I can officially say that I've ridden pump jacks. Oh my god, that's hilarious. That was that was the one thing we didn't do, but we probably got much closer than any of us would care to admit. We were like, who's going to do it? Um, but yeah, like it just looks so inviting. You want to hop on yep. there and pretend it's like uh, you're riding a dragon or some shit. But anyway, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I guess for anyone listening, please don't do that. <laughs> any, actually, don't do anything that I say because I, I get into <laughs> trouble apparently. So <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. Wise words exactly. to live by. Well, like, I mean, I, I, I want to ask, like, what it was like then, like, moving to Uvalde and, and like, what, what, because that's still, you know, granted, it's bigger than 1,200 people, but not by a whole lot. We're talking, like, 15,000 people. Um, yeah, there's about 15,000. And the thing is, is that when we moved here, so when I work, I, I put a lot into work. I'm the guy that, you know, my bosses would call and be like, hey, uh, we need you to come stay the night out at the site because we don't have comps. All right, bet. Like, I liked overtime. I didn't like working the overtime per se, but I liked overtime pay, you know? And so, um, you know, that was a hard thing to manage between being a father and being a husband and still, you know, putting food on the table and everything. And I'm the guy that's like, if I work hard 
eventually they'll see and I can take that next step, you know, um, because man, I, I was starting to get old already, you know, like my, my knees are shot, my back is shot. Like I've been doing these rough and crazy jobs my whole adult life, you know? And so, you know, it, you Valby wasn't anything different to me really aside from I got to go to Walmart I got to order Sonic I got to you know there is a movie theater here wasn't the greatest but there was one here you know so aside from that it was just like I worked and I came home to be with my kids um, and my wife so I didn't know anybody I didn't have any friends like my only friends here were the guys that I worked with who weren't from here either you know, all of the guys that I worked with came from other places across Texas. So I didn't, Uvalde was, didn't mean anything to me. It was just, all right, here's the next step in my, in my career. Um, if something better comes along, I'll take it. If not, it, this is a good site to work at. You know, it's, uh, we called it a retirement site because you either go there to start your career because it was chill or you went there to end your career because it was chill. Um, and so, yeah, I, I didn't mess with anybody, really. Like, I would go to work, come home. I, if my kids were in sports, I would take them. You know, that was probably the biggest thing because back home, I would coach my son's T-ball and his flag football. And over here, I lost a lot of time to be able to do that, but it was so much bigger that these these people that ran it, that they already had it. They didn't need any more coaches or anything like that. So, I mean, aside from literally just chilling with my kids and my wife, I mean, I didn't, I didn't go around you, Valdi. Hmm. Well, well, I mean, like, I want to just hover on that for a second, right? Before we talk about you, Valdi, because again, I want people to remember, you know, like, the stakes of this and, and the reality of this. And I also want us to remember the full picture of you and your family making a life together. And and I just wanted to ask if there are memories that stick out or, or things from that moment before everything changed, you know, that, that really stick out as, as precious memories that you want to hold on to or things that you want folks to also think of and remember when we talk about what happened at Robb Elementary. Yeah, I mean... And so we're a really tight knit family. So I can't even like pull just like one memory because we do everything together at all times for the most part. Um, but I will say like, you know, I'm not a religious man or anything, but I like to give my kids somewhat of the childhood that I did, you know, the better part. So we, we celebrate every holiday. And so for like Easter, we love e like Halloween's our favorite because we like horror and we like, Dressing Same. up and everything, bro. Yeah. Our fa our family, we were the embarrassing Mexican house on the street that went all out for <laughs> Halloween. <laughs> so I'm with you. Yeah, yeah. So you know, we do everything, and and like I said, we didn't know people here, so we just do stuff together. But I, our Easter's were always fun because what we would do is get the uh, the confetti eggs. And, you know, I would hide them. Then the kids would go around picking them up. And it was just an all out war of just smacking each other with, <laughs> you know, the eggs. And, you know, one of the pictures that I have of Uzi, well, there's several from our last Easter together, but you can see the confetti over everyone. And it was always unfair to me because I hit them. So I couldn't find them. So my kids would just be nailing me with the with those confetti eggs and everything and i'm having to like pick them up and like body slam them trying to steal some eggs but yeah it's we you know we we like playing and this is going to sound weird but we play monopoly together and nobody flips the table so i mean it's just there's a lot of shit talking um <laughs> my family all of my children are really good at, at talking shit and letting you know that they're gonna win um <laughs> So, yeah, man, we just we we do a lot of things together. We game together. Um, you know, we would play Fortnite. So we have several at the time they were PS4s. We'd have like five PS4s in the house just so that we could all jump on games and play together. So it's just, you know, like I said, mostly we're just really tight. And we did everything together, you know, go to the rivers together and just just have fun because. It was always work and school and everything. So when we got to have fun, you know, we did it big for just our family. 
I love that, man. And as far as shit talking goes, the apple don't fall far from the tree, I'm sure. <laughs> they learned that it, from somewhere. <laughs> not at all. My kids say the wildest shit, and I absolutely love it. Like, they, if, if they find a weakness, they go for it. And, <laughs> and not in a mean and malicious way. Like just in a in a joking way, but man, they are they're vicious. But you know, they learn from the best. So they they try to push it out. But I I always remind them. I'm like, y'all know where y'all got that from, right? <laughs> yeah. Don't step don't step to the king, baby. <laughs> that, like... That's what I'm saying. I always tell my kids, I'm like, you might think you're Billy ba Badass until you meet Billy Badass, and, you, <laughs> and your daddy is Billy Badass. So. This sounds so much like my family. It's cracking me up because we talk so much shit, whether it's poker or like a dumb game we came up with in the pool. Immediately, everyone's talking shit. So, like, I identify oh, with this a lot. <laughs> oh, and we're we're competitive as hell. Nobody mm. likes to lose in my family. So, like, we we will we go all out, man, just uh, of running the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, man. It makes it more fun. So I'm mm -hmm. all for it. And the, again, the fact that you guys can play Monopoly without it uh, ending in like someone moving away, like is a sign of a strong family, I think. <laughs> oh, yeah. like, no, it's so it's so bad that we we like collect different Monopoly boards like we have oh. this, like. 20 some odd mono different monopoly boards so it's just at that point where the kids are like all right do you want to play spider-man monopoly i'm like do you want me to whoop your ass like we'll do it yeah, exactly what what theme do you want to have your ass whooped to today exactly we can do princesses if you'd like i don't care <laughs> I'm still gonna take that boardwalk, baby. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I mean, I love that. I'm so I'm so glad that that you shared that with us. Um, because again, that's that's what I yeah really want people to be thinking about as well and cherishing and and like and 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 knowing just like how we can go from that to what happened at Rob Elementary, like, before we get there, I just want to kind of ask this question. Since we're talking mm -hmm. about living in a small town, living tight-knit family, tight-knit communities, I feel like one thing that has really changed in America since Columbine, right? Because you, you and I both remember Columbine. We remember mm -hmm. how shocked the country was that it not only that it happened, but that it happened where it happened and in the way that it did. And, and it feels like we've just been going further into hell ever since then while claiming that this is never going to happen again. And it happens every goddamn month in this country. So how did we get there? But like the question that that really kind of sticks out to me is I think in the years after Columbine and. <sighs> Until recently, I think a lot of the ways people would talk about this is like, we never thought it could happen here. Like this never, like this always felt like something that happened somewhere else. But I really feel like something is broken in our culture where now people are less surprised when it happens where they live. Like, or maybe even they're expecting it. Like that, that it's a call that no parent should ever expect but more parents in this country are preparing themselves for than ever before. Like that, if that's not a sign of a broken fucking country, I don't know what is. But the the point of bringing it up is like, did you feel that way? Like, did 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 like it feel like this is the kind of place where this could never happen? Absolutely, absolutely, one hundred percent. And that is one of my biggest regrets in life, um, because this don't happen in Texas. In Texas, of all places. You know, in Texas, we're good guys with a gun. They, they'll stop anything, and it doesn't happen. But, you know, they failed to, to talk about, you know, Waco. They failed to talk about um, Sutherland Springs. They failed to talk about Santa Fe, and these are all mass shootings. Um, but it happens so much that people, I don't think people are preparing um, in the sense that they think that it'll happen to them because I, I believe that most of the country is like, this is this happens on TV. This doesn't happen here. Except in America, at this point, it's not a matter of if it if it's going to happen to you. It's a matter of when. And unfortunately, that's why we we try to do what we do, and that's to get people to fight beforehand. Because you know, I remember, you know, I was young when Columbine happened, but I remember it, it was it was crazy. 
Um, and then the next big one that I really remembered was Santa Fe. I mean, I was working, I had kids that age. Um, and I remember being at work when the news broke and I'm like, man, that, that sucks. Well, I got to get back to work because this tower ain't going to fix itself. You go home, you hug your kids a little bit tighter that day. You know, you, you, you do all of these things for the next few weeks and then it's, then it's over. And then you don't think about it again. And then Parkland happens, you know, and once again, I'm at work when it happens and well, fuck that sucks. Well, I got to go fix this turbine because it ain't going to fix itself. You go home and, and you you keep doing the same thing over and thinking, yeah, if that that just happens on TV. That That's never going to happen here until it does, until it does. And then, like, there's a lot of things that, that happen after that that you don't even realize. Like, I bet everybody listening to this can tell you the names of who committed that act at Columbine. But can they tell you the name of the victims? And that's the hard part. And that is something that I realized early on. And I remember, you know, when I'm first making these connections with these other parents from all these different shootings, I, I know parents from Columbine. I know parents from Parkland and from Sandy Hook and everything like that. And my thing was, I, I called them and I apologized. I apologized because I said, I didn't know your kid's name. And that is one of the driving forces. Well, before I even get there, you know, they, they would apologize back to me. They'd say, we're sorry we haven't done enough, that now you're in this fight with us. And it's a, it's a very surreal moment because you have two people in the same space, in the same club, that we don't want any more people to join. But you have a parent saying, you know, I'm sorry, I didn't fight beforehand. And you have other parents saying, I'm sorry that we've been fighting, but nothing's been done. Um, and then you, you come together on that. And, um, you know, it, it makes you think like and one of the main reasons why I, I fight as hard as I do and the number one reason and it's selfish. It, it is extremely selfish of me that the number one reason that I fight is so that my son is remembered, that he's not a statistic. I don't want him to be remembered as kid 18 out of 21 from the U Uvalde shooting. I don't want him to be remembered as one out of the 40,000 or whatever the number is that were murdered in 2022. I don't want that because he wasn't a number. He was real. He was larger than life to us. And so I want the world to see that, you know, and that, like I said, it is selfish because that is my main goal is to make sure that he's remembered followed by very, very closely behind making changes to prevent it. But, you know, you, the, this country has become so desensitized that it, it's, it's really funny because I get this question a lot. And um, what shooting was he from? Oh it happens God. that it happens that fucking much. And I don't even take offense to it because I'm like, I mean, one, I'm going to educate you real quick, but two, it happens that much that we as a society can't even keep up with it. And so, you know, it's, 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 it's the questions like that where it keeps me going. Like, no, I have to, I have to keep talking about him and I have to keep fighting for him. You know, everything that we do is for him. And, but even on that note, no matter what I say, no matter what I do, no matter what changes I make in this country in his name, he's never coming back. But I can't prevent another parent from having to do this. Man, I, I just, I, I genuinely cannot imagine um, that weight. Yeah, I really can't. I mean, but again, I, I am nothing but grateful to you for using all that pain uh, and trying to make something good out of it um, because yeah, we need it. And well, I was just going to ask like, cause I think this is really important what you just said for so many reasons, but also for the conversation we're having now, I want to ask you in a second, you know, for as much or as little as you want to share about your memories of that day. But before we do, I want to start with what you just said. I want people, before we talk about that, to remember your son, Uzziah. Like, what do you most want folks to know about your son? What's the memory you want to 
uphold for folks? So he, you know, every, every parent is going to be biased, right? Um, and I'm extremely biased, but at the same time, I truly have not met another person that cared and, uh, and loved as much as he did. Um, he hated seeing people sad. I mean, he hated it. He would go out of his way to make you laugh, to, to, to take your mind off of whatever it was, even for a few seconds, funny faces, funny voices, flipping around the room, just whatever he could. And he was just so helpful that, you know, we, we sat down with him one day and, you know, we do it with all of our kids, but we were talking to him and, and I said, uh, and my wife and I asked him, we go, uh, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he goes, well, I want to be a YouTuber. Like every kid wants to be a YouTuber, right? And so we told him, we're like, you know, uh, we'll help. You know, we'll, we'll get you whatever you need to start it and we'll help you. You know, but, you know, we also, you know, you're, you're 10 at the time. You know, you're not thinking realistically. So we're like, but realistically, like, you know, everybody wants to be a YouTuber. You might not make it. So let's have a, a fallback plan and something else that you can do in case the YouTube doesn't take off. And he goes, well, then I want to be a cop so that I can help people the way that y'all help me. And, uh, I mean, that was, that was him. That was him. He just, he loved and his, his energy was just always a million and he never stopped. Um, you know, he would wait for me after work, my work, Sometimes I'd get out at 3.30. Sometimes it wouldn't be 9 o'clock at night, you know. But he'd always be there and he'd want to race, you know. And so, um, you know, that's that's another regret that I have, too, is, like, I wouldn't race every day because, you know, you get home at 9 o'clock, you know, and I'm, buddy, I'm just, I'm tired. I, I need to eat and I need to go to bed. And, but he was always there. He was the, he was our little energizer bunny. I mean, he just kept going and going and going nonstop. And even when he was sad about something, if he saw that you were sad, he would completely change to just make you smile, even for just a few seconds. Man, thank you for sharing that with us, brother. I, I really appreciate it. And I, Again, like what do like what do I know? What can I say? But like I, I will just say, as someone um who interviews other workers for a living about their lives, about their families, and who hears every single week how much this world demands from us every day, demands from working people. Um, and I think one of the most common refrains I hear from people is I just wish I had more time. Um and I think that's if I'm hearing that from people, not just like you, but I'm hearing it from Frito Lay workers on strike. You know, I'm hearing it from nurses. I'm hearing it from you know manufa car manufacturers. Like something is deeper and more more deeply wrong here, uh, <clears throat> with how little time we allow ourselves and our fellow workers, how much time we actually have to to be with our families to to do the things that make life worth living. If there's any comfort you can take in that, I just want to assure you that um, it's, it's, it's not all you, man. This, this country demands way too much from us and gives back way too little, I think. 100%, man. And, and the other thing, like the, another thing that this makes me think of, when you were talking about, you know, it's not a matter of if this will happen to you, but when... That is also what people who I've been interviewing all for all the past year in East Palestine, Ohio, have been telling me. If folks remember, this is where the Norfolk Southern train derailed a year ago. They lit all those toxic chemicals on fire, and now that community is poisoned. People don't know if their kids are getting cancer playing in the grass or breathing in the fumes. Like, it's a nightmare. But what they have all kept saying is, like, this isn't just a one-off tragedy. There are over a 1,000 derailments happening around the country a year. This could literally happen again in your backyard tomorrow. And, like, like we got we to gotta do something about this because we're going to run out of, quote-unquote, zones to sacrifice at this point. We're going to run out of school districts where people can feel safe if we don't do anything like this. And the, and the thing I really want to stress for folks listening is just like the people we've been talking to in East Palestine, 
are working people like you and me, even if like we're not talking about their jobs, but we're talking about this thing that is happening in their lives while they're still trying to work and live and make a living for their families. That's that's a, that's what we're talking about here with Brett and this entire community. Brett was at work when he got that call. Like, I mean, these this is us. This is our communities. This is not someone else this is happening to. And the sooner we recognize that, the better, I think. And and Brett, I just, I want to just ask again, really just following your lead. Please. We do not have to talk at length about it. I know you've talked about it many times. So if folks want to listen to that, they can find it. But I just wanted to to ask at this point, like if there are memories or points of, that, that stick out in your memory from that day that you really want listeners to remember. Yeah, and I, I can go through the whole day. In, in fact, it, it starts the night previously. Um, I didn't see Uzi the day of the shooting. Um, the last time I saw him was around 10 o'clock the night before. He was sitting at the table playing his phone. Um, I just walked in there. I'm like, hey, bud, it's it's time to go to bed. I ruffled his hair, you know, kissed the top of his head and told him to go to bed. And he said, yes, sir. And he, he went upstairs. I didn't realize at that moment that that would be the last time that I saw him um, because I would have held on still hard. Um, but, you know, I, I got up to go to work. It was, you know, 5, 530 in the morning drive the 45 minutes or whatever to work I, it was just like a normal day man I'm, I'm sitting there in the office um i'm making booklets and pamphlets so that our my co-workers can do something in it and then it goes to them getting a raise you know like you you fill out all of these things ojt's pretty much um you fill these out and you'll you're a step closer to your promotion and i'm i'm working on those and uh, i get a call from my wife and i just hear her screaming and she says this is not a fucking joke there's a shooter at the boys school so i had two kids um in that school um at the same time they were both in fourth grade their classrooms were three uh rooms apart one of my sons was not there that day um he was at home and so uh, that was just a little context from my wife calls she's like this is not a fucking joke there's a there's a shooter at the bully school so and then i'm like okay and then i hang up she hangs up i can't really remember who hung up but then i look at my my lead tech and i look at him and i said dude there's a there's a shooter at my kid's school like in disbelief, like I couldn't, this isn't real, you know? And he looks at me for a second. He goes, well, then get the fuck out of here. And so I just ran to my car and got into it. Um, I'm, I start driving. I'm going 100, 105, whatever my little piece of shit car would go. Um, and I see cops passing me. And at first, when they started coming up on me, I'm like, they can arrest me when I get to the school because I'm not stopping. Um, but they just start passing me. You know, I had to drive through a, every day. I had to drive through a border patrol station to come home where they stop you and they ask you, are you an American citizen and all of that? They had it wide open. And so I just I, I'm hauling ass through. My wife calls me um, and she was like, hurry, 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 get here. Um, he's in the fourth grade wing. And so I'm, I'm talking to her and that, you know, at that moment I hear pop, 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 pop. I hear four shots and my wife just lets out a, a hellacious scream and everything. And I'm like, I'm, I'm getting there as fast as I can. And so I just keep driving. And as I'm pulling into town, um, I get another call from my wife and she's like, just go to the civic center. They're not letting us near the kids. They're not letting us do anything. They're making us leave, go to the civic center. Mind you, my wife got there to the school before the school even sent out alerts. So the way we found out was my daughter that was in high school texts my wife and says, hey, there's a shooter at the boys' school. And my wife was like, ah, quit playing with me. You know, My daughter had a video of the kid walking into the school. 
So a kid from across the street took it on like Snapchat or something and sent it to the high school. So we knew before anything, and my wife hauled ass and was there pretty much damn near the whole time. Um, before any school alerts, before any police alerts or anything, my wife was there. She was getting pushed around by cops. They were yelling at her. They were telling her, you know, they would be saying, hey, get in there and everything. And the cops would be like, oh, well, we would if, if we didn't have to deal with you fucks. You know, shit like that. And so by the time I get into town, um, I'm guessing, I'm trying to, you know, get my memory correct on if the shooter was already dead at that point. I don't know. Like, we didn't know anything. But looking back, I think he had already been taken out because they were trying to transport kids. So I get to the Civic Center. I'm one of the first ones there, and I'm waiting. And, you know, it's just... It's like a fever dream because you're like, well, what the fuck do I do? I'm just standing here. What do I do? You know? Okay, I got to wait for them because they're like, well, we're going to start dropping off kids by buses. If, you're, if your child's teacher is called, then, you know, your kid is here. Go inside. And I was there before the buses came. My wife finally shows up. The buses are coming. And every time a bus comes that his teacher's name wasn't called, it was just a, it was a gut punch. It was like fuck, fuck, you know? And so at that point, I called my other son um, who was at home and I said, hey, I can't get a hold of Uzi. Nobody knows where Uzi's at. Can you call his friends? And he goes, yeah, I'll try. About five, 10 minutes later, he calls me back and he goes, he goes, dad, nobody can get a hold of Uzi. He goes, but they're saying his teacher was shot. And at that moment, I knew. I, I, I just knew. Um, and we still had to wait. Um, we waited, we waited, we waited. The agonizing minutes, hours. And then they finally tell us, they're like, okay, uh, all of y'all who are still here, come inside the Civic Center. There's no more buses coming. And at that point, you know, words getting around on social media and people are talking and they're saying, oh, well, the kids ran to the funeral home or they ran into the neighborhood and everything like that. And one of Uzi's best friends lived right down the road from Rob and he would go there, you know, after school sometimes. They would just walk to his house because it was literally like 700 feet, maybe like it wasn't far at all. Um so my wife is like, all right, you stay here in case they show up. I'm going to go and look for them. So she went to the funeral home. He wasn't there. She checked the neighborhood, wasn't there, went to the hospital, and they can't tell her if he's there or not. So she comes back. And then at that moment, um, we're sitting in there, and all of a sudden, we, you know, people are scrolling through Facebook trying to put out, have you seen my kid? And Abbott is on, I, I don't. I don't know what he was doing, but it, we saw it on Facebook, right? And he was saying, yeah, in Uvalde, there were 14 kids killed and one teacher, which, as we know now, was wrong. But at the time, too, you looking around and starting counting, you're like, one, two, three, there, there's about 14 other families, 13 other families here. And it's just like, this dude let the whole world know before we knew that our kids were murdered. And so we're still waiting we're asking the the Texas Rangers, you know, we're we're trying, you know, they're like, can you tell us anything, you know, so we can, they wouldn't tell us why, but they're like, what were they wearing and everything? And my wife was like, well, he had on these shoes and then, you know, they're, but wouldn't tell us why. And so around that time, I have to go pick up my other kid from school to my high school girls. They just, um, they walked home, I believe. I don't, I can't remember 100%. Um, but I didn't have to pick them up, but I had to pick up my youngest one who was in this first grade at the time. So I'll pick them up and it took about two hours of me sitting in line while my wife is at the Civic Center. We're trying to find Uzi, but I have to pick up my other kid. And it took about two hours and I finally picked them up and uh, they asked, hey, where's Uzi? And I just, the, the only thing I could think of was just to tell him, hey, I picked you up first. Because they didn't know what was going on. 
And so took him to the house, went back up to the Civic Center about eight o'clock when they call us back. And we were like one of the first ones. They call us back. Um, they s tell my wife to sit down. She says, no, I, they tell me to sit down. I'm like, no, I'm good standing. Um, and the detective, he just goes, I hate to tell you this, but Uzziah was one of the victims. And if you've never heard a mother lose a child, it is the worst sound in the entire world. There is a, there is a guttural pain that you hear that is indescribable. And the closest thing that I can, I can say I've heard to it was, um, if you've ever watched the, the play Hamilton, when the mother loses her son, that scream that she lets out, that's about the closest I can tell you that that is what it sounds like. And the first thing I do though, I look at that. I look at that officer and I, I just tell him, I say, where the fuck is that son of a bitch? I'm going to kill him. And he was like, well, he has been, he's been murdered or he's been taken out or whatever he said. And then it's just, boom, that's it. That my world right there just crumbled, fell apart. And you're just sitting there in like an abyss of nothingness because you can't, you can't comprehend it. I still, to this day, it's, it's been almost two years now, and I still can't comprehend the fact that my son is not going to walk through that door ever again. Um, and so the news is everywhere, right? Um, and so I walk out to the front. I have a blank look on my face. I go to get our car. I drive it around the back of the Civic Center to pick up my wife. And then we go home. And we're driving home and my wife is, is she's bawling and she goes, what do we tell the kids? And I, I told my wife, I said, you, she goes, I can't, I can't tell them. I can't, I can't tell them. And so I said, you just, you wait outside for a second and I'll go in and I'll tell them. And so I'd already called up my older children to have everybody down in the living room. But when I walked in, you know, they're anxious and they're nervous and they know that something's happened, but they don't know what. And so I just told him, I said, guys, Uzi, Uzi was killed. He's, he's not coming back. And I had two kids just drop to the floor. One of my older kids was trying to hold on to them. Um, I'm holding them. I had another kid that ran outside. Um, and it was the hardest thing that I've ever had to do was tell my kids that their, their brother wasn't coming home ever again. And then I didn't sleep for about three days. It, no, no parent should ever have to go through that. Um, and I'm, I'm so... I'm so sorry that you guys went through that. Um, and I'm sorry that this country failed your family so much and that this fucking shithole of a society <clears throat> continues to let this happen. And I don't know. There's nothing I can say that, that, that will get through to people more than what you just heard from Brett. I'm begging you guys to listen, to stop letting this happen. To stop accepting this as acceptable. This is, un this is as unacceptable as it gets. If your society permits the annual slaughter of school children and nothing changes, that is not a society worth a damn or worth saving. Like, you've got to start over. You've got, this is, this is, we're so far gone to allow this kind of pain to and this kind of horror to just become commonplace. And I I know that that is the fight that you and your wife have, have fully committed to yourself after this. And I want to just let what your story be there for folks. I, I, I want folks to just listen to that. And I, I know I don't have too long with you, but I want to focus the last part of it on that fight. 
and and um, what's basically what's happened since, um, you know, and 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 where are you and and your wife, your family, with this fight? Is there any movement on the uh, on the government side? Like, what can people do to join you to stop this madness? So I will say, and and before I get into that, I will say this as well. Um, uh, just a few things. One, um, I will say it was quiet. That you know the world is is burning down around us, but it was quiet. And what I mean by that is. I have a big house, um, and I mean, I have a lot of kids, you know, I have, I have six living kids at this moment. Um, and so my, my house is always loud, it's always bustling. Kids are fighting and screaming and playing and, and yelling. And I mean, there's six kids. It's, it's never quiet. It was quiet. It was quiet for the longest time. Um, whereas Uzi and my other son, their room was literally right above ours. We would hear them at night and everything. 1030 at night, little boys still playing around and everything because they don't want to go to bed. You know, so we would have to, you know, yell like, boys, quiet down. Um, so it's quiet, um, especially in the beginning. My my kids are starting to come around and, and make more noise and everything, but it's it's deafening, the quiet is. And so at that moment, you know, um, we didn't have his funeral until three weeks after. They wouldn't even let us see his body um, for about three weeks. We finally got to have his funeral on June 13th. And um, honestly, like, we weren't going to fight. And then misinformation started getting printed. And then we're hearing that these cops just waited outside, that they didn't do nothing that Abbott is continuously loosening these gun laws and everything. And it, it, it just pissed me off, man. And so we started by going the, the weekend after Uzi's funeral, we had our first protest and we would set up every Saturday and Sunday at the plaza in the middle of town, holding up signs, calling for accountability first for the, the chief of the school police who is the one that kept saying like, oh, there's time on our side. We know that there's children dying in there, but, you know, they're going to hate us for that, but we have to do it this way or whatever. We started that. And just to remind folks, we're talking an hour and 14 fucking minutes that all of those police, different, different police forces that were there. We had marshals there. We had local police. We had state police. And they sat on their asses for over an hour. Sorry, I just wanted to add that. Yeah, yeah. No, 376 officers from varying different agencies sat there for 77 minutes. Um, yeah. And so we started fighting, and it wasn't until August 24th, which is three months to the day since we lost Uzi, that they finally fired him. It took them three months to do so, and he was still a city council member. And so we had to get him taken away from that as well. And it was just like, the, the longer it went on, at first, like this community seemed, you know, well-knit. And, you know, I, I can't thank people enough. I don't think we had to worry about food until like June 15th because people were doing food trains for us. Like, you know, um, helping, helping us. And, shit. and um, so at first it was, you know, I wasn't really going to get into anything, but as time went on, it was, oh, the cops didn't do anything wrong. And, oh, we need to just sweep this under the rug. We need to move on. And, uh, 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 and then the videos start coming out showing that they're just sitting there showing them saying, yeah, well, there's kids in there, but you know, whatever, pretty much. So, uh, I believe it was September 27th and I could be wrong, but, um, late September, I staged a sit out outside of the school administration building. And my thing was, was I never called in the beginning. I never called for anyone to get fired. I called for them to do an investigation and have them suspended until the investigation was complete and they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do it. And so all of these officers that were there, uh, so I think out of all 376, only five have been reprimanded Five. Um, and so these cops, they're out on the streets. 
they'll give you a ticket. They'll, you'll see them at Walmart. You'll see them at, you know, your local HEB, your grocery store, you'll see them everywhere and they don't care. And so I was just so pissed off that I let, I let my mouth get the best of me. So I, um, me and my wife had just came back from DC cause we're, we're pushing federal. We push state, we push city. Like we're fighting three, four or five different fronts at one time. It's hectic, but we get back and we, in DC, we saw people getting arrested for sitting in front of, of a, um, the Senate building where the Senate has their offices for just standing in front of it. They're getting arrested. And I'm like, fuck it. Right. Me and my wife are like, fuck it. So the next we get back and we set it up and we're going to go there and we sit in front of the school administration building. And I told that, like, I got pissed off because one, one of the guys put his hands on me and shit. And, uh, that it really irritated me, but I stood my ground. And, uh, finally the superintendent came and he was like, Oh, well, we got to get into work and everything. And I'm like, what work, what work your school is part of the reason that my son is dead, you know? And, uh, he just kept saying, well, we got to get in there. And I said, I am not moving here until you suspend all of these officers 10 days later and with some great reporting they suspend the whole police force for the school because they had hired a dps agent who was under investigation they had hired her and we had gotten video where she was saying oh i don't know what we're doing out here if it was my kid in there i would have been inside but we finally got that done in texas we got a bill out of committee we had to raise the age bill from 18 to 21 to purchase assault rifles. Get out of committee. It was a fight. I got kicked out of the Capitol for being too loud. Um, but, it, I mean, it was a fight to the very end, and we finally got it out of committee, which is something that has, like, never happened in Texas because Texas is about loosening gun laws. But we got it out of committee. We, it didn't get passed. It didn't even make it to calendars to where they'll put it up on the floor, but we made it. So... I didn't think it was going to make it this time anyways, but what I see it as is a beacon, as a, as a symbol of hope that when we stick together, when we bend together as a people and we start to realize that we don't work for the government. No, no, the government works for us. And if we stand together and we make enough noise, they have to listen to us because they'll, they'll try to silence us. They'll try to make us be quiet. But when parents come together, when children come together and say enough is enough, we're tired of getting killed in schools, we're tired of burying our children, we make movement. And it might not be very big right now, but every step forward is a step forward. And as long as we're moving forward to save lives, then I will continue to do it no matter what. Yeah, man, as, as we say all the time on this show, no one can do everything, but everyone can do something. And uh, I'm so grateful to you, your wife, your community for, for doing something out of this unimaginable tragedy. And I just, I'd be remiss if I didn't, A, ask like by way of rounding us out, if you had any final words to folks out there listening um, about the shooting, about this fight and how, like what they can do to get involved themselves, wherever they are. Like, what would you tell people who are listening to this and now they know they want to get in this fight? Where should they go? And I would also be remiss if I didn't mention that after everything you guys just heard, after knowing about everything this family has been through and all that Brett has, and, and, and you know, that this family have been doing to try to be heard, we are recording this on Tuesday, February 27th. And yesterday, this, the, the, these fuckers arrested Brett for trying to, again, get accountability for raising his voice too much. Like, I just wanted to, like, give you a sec to, like, like if, any, if people are hearing about this, like, just point out how absurd that is. And then, yeah, please round us out. Let folks know what they can do to get involved. And I promise I'll let you go, brother. Yeah, no, no worries, man. So, yeah, yesterday I was arrested. We went to a uh, county commissioner's meeting. The acting chief of police on that day, and when I mean acting chief of police is because our chief of police was on vacation. So the guy that was filling in for him had like 27 years experience, some crazy number like that. Um, he was the acting chief of police. He got a call from dispatch saying 
there are eight to nine kids in there. And then he walked off. He, he didn't give that information to anyone. He just walked off. He is the county commissioner. One, he got re-voted in. So this community is not, I, I don't like the whole Uvalde Strong thing because a lot of people just want to sweep it under the rug. They want us to move on and be quiet and everything like that. I'm a loud mouth, so you ain't going to fucking quiet me. But he is a, a county commissioner. So we go to these county commissioning meetings all the time. Um, you know, we've missed a couple here and there for different events and shit. But we we go up there, and he finally shows up. This is the this is the fourth county commissioner's meeting in 2024. And this is the first one that he showed up to because the DOJ released their report noting that he felt miserably. So we're in there. We're sitting through the regular bullshit county commissioner meeting. Um, and I had signed up to speak. So it was my turn to speak. And so I do what I always did. And we speak under payroll because our taxes pay his salary. He let children be murdered and we're paying his salary. And so I was just questioning him on that. Just the same thing because he will not respond. He sits there with a smug look on his face, like he got away with it, you know? And so I'm just talking, you know, saying the same stuff over and over, talking about, oh, he had 180 hours of leadership training, but where was that leadership? If he couldn't lead his people on that day, what makes you think he's going to lead a, a community? And um, I... He... <laughs> Sorry. It, I, I, it's funny to me because I get to the point where I'm like, you know, there were... You got the call that there were eight to nine children left in the, uh, alive in the building, and you walk the fuck away. And then the judge gets all, like, big and bad, and he goes, so if you're going to continue to speak, you can't use that language. And at that moment, I'm like, this is what you're upset about? Not the fact that you're sitting literally next to the motherfucker that walked away with that information, who is complicit in our children being murdered. You're not upset about that. Like, you're literally bumping elbows with the guy. But you're upset because I said fuck. So I just, I told him, I said, language. I said, my child is fucking dead. And then I'm in handcuffs. So, like, I get arrested for saying the word fuck twice. Like, uh, apparently you can't do that here in Texas. Um, so I get arrested. And if you watch the video and everything, I'm surprised. I'm like, I'm, I'm being arrested. And I'm asking, what am I being arrested for? And they cannot tell me. They will not tell me. I get taken to jail. And by the way, sh huge shout out to my wife because my wife was sick yesterday and she ran all over town, call making calls, figuring out what was going on. She was right there when I got out and everything. But it took them three hours to finally book me because they were trying to find out what they could book me for. So I finally got charged with disrupting a meeting or procession. The funny part about that is one, uh, they violated my First Amendment rights. Um, and two, uh, how did I disrupt a meeting when I was signed up to speak? I was involved in the meeting. How do I disrupt a meeting that I'm in? Right? Like, and I didn't say, I could see if I was threatening in any way, if I was like walking up to them or if I'm like, Hey man, fuck you or anything like that. I didn't. And so, yeah, I, I get arrested, uh, for disrupting a meeting yesterday. Um, I, Took them three hours to book me. I was out by hour four and everything. And the the thing that is the craziest about this is we've been saying this for the past two years that the people in power, the people in charge here, they're trying to sweep it under the rug. They want you to forget about it. They want to move on. When these people have made so much money off of our children being dead, being murdered, the city has gotten millions. The school has gotten millions. The county has gotten millions. And then they want us to shut up, but they brought it to light. Like they, they screwed themselves because now the world gets to see that everything that I've been saying for the past two years, that they make up trumped up charges they They try to get us in trouble. They try to silence us. It's factual. It isn't just me saying this and looking like a conspiracy theorist or, or something. It is look, there is evidence. Now I got arrested for saying fuck only in Texas. Only in Texas. Um, but yeah, no, um, it, it was wild. But, you know, to your other question, you know, some of the things that people can do. One, I read the DOJ report every night on TikTok Live to people because, 
yeah, I get it. Sometimes you don't have time to sit down and read, but if you can have it on and listen and you can see, um, we have found so many discrepancies and so many issues of, that the police have caused. So we do that every night for the most part. Um, the shotline.org is a website that was created by Manny and Patricia Oliver, whose son Joaquin was killed in Parkland, and they teamed up with March for Our Lives. And what it is is we regenerated our, our children's voices with AI to send a message to Congress asking when is enough enough? Um, so you will get to hear Uzi's voice on there. Um, and it's heartbreaking. It is. But it takes 10 seconds to do. You pick a voice. Uh, you pick somebody that has been murdered by gun violence. Type in your zip code. And it gives you your representatives. Right now, we're already at over 100,000 calls. And it we wanted to continue to continue to continue. I want to shut their phone boxes down to show them that people really care. And by that, I mean, it is so hard to do this fight. I know, you know, people see me all the time. I'm always going, I'm always doing it, but it is a struggle. It is devastating. And it is so much easier to fight before you're in my shoes. So fight before you get into my shoes. Um, and, you know, you, you mentioned earlier, you said you can't even imagine. And that's one of the things that I wrote a song. It's on Spotify. It's on Apple. It's called Imagine. Because I would rather you imagine it than live it. And that is pretty much the whole premise of it. So if anybody wants to check that out. But, you know, follow uh, Change the Ref. Change the Ref. That's Manny and Patricia Oliver. They, uh, they we're a lot similar. I, I've got a nonprofit that is... Um, so close to being completed and being up called rice for you um it's named that way because everything that we do is for you zaya and for you the people because as i've stated nothing i say or do can bring him back but i can help you um and so we'll be doing that um but there are a lot of great organizations but the thing is is that a talk is cheap talk is cheap you have to walk the walk too you can't sit here and be like, I hate this. I don't want this to happen. And then not do anything. That is why the term thoughts and prayers irritates me so much because prayer without action is null and void. And um, so call your senators, call your representatives, call your governor, blow up their phones. It takes five minutes to call any of these people. Tell them that you've had enough, that you are sick of children dying in these schools and at malls and at parking lots and at, you know, dash recitals, all of that, because gun violence is the number one killer of children from zero to 19. It is, it's unacceptable. You know, as a parent, your only job in this world is to protect your kid. We are failing. We are failing because we are not protecting our children. Yeah, we might think that we are, but as a society, as a whole, you know, we grew up in a time where it was supposed to be, you know, it, it takes a village to raise a child. Well, that village is okay with them being murdered at this point. And we have to change that. And that starts with each and every one of us. We can't do this alone. But at the same time, even if I am the last one standing, I'm still going to continue. 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 When my face you no longer see, I live on, yes, I live on. Wherever we go, we are going to roll the union on the song. I live on, yes, I live on. Wherever hungry, hungry are we. Just as hungry as hungry can be. The song, I live on, yes, I live on. Where mean things are happening in this land, it's read a song, I live on, yes, I live on. Wherever the book means things are happening in this land is read, I live on. Yes, I live on. Wherever the videotape of me is shown, I live on. Yes, I live on. If I have help to make this a better world to live in, I'll live on. Yes, I'll live on. When my body is silent and in some lonesome grave, I live on. Yes, I live on. When my songs and poems are read, I live on, yes, I live on.
Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.